It's January 1645. Emperor Shah Jahan, who commissioned the Taj Mahal, sits on the Mughal throne in Agra. One day, a dispatch rider from his court arrives in the East India Company's factory in Surat, on the west coast of India, with an urgent message. The message was sent by Emperor's military chief, Asalat Khan. What did this message say? Well, keep listening. Hello everyone! Hope all our listeners worldwide are safe. I'm your host, Tintin, and this is another episode of the Stupid History Podcast, where we discover some of the stupidest events in the history of colonial Bengal. Today's episode is called Indict Me If You Can. In January 1645, the East India Company received an urgent dispatch from the military chief of Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. The letter urged the East India Company to send a very good doctor to the royal court of Agra immediately. A few months earlier, the emperor's favorite daughter, Princess Jahanara Begum's clothes had accidentally caught on fire in the palace. While the princess clung to her life, the emperor fetched doctors from every corner of his huge empire to treat her. As a response to this message, and in the hopes of gathering some influence at the Mughal court, the East India Company sent Gabriel Boughton, a ship surgeon who happened to be in Surat at that time. And then, the records go silent about him. Fast forward to 1648. It seems Boughton had impressed the Mughal court with his medical skills and made a name for himself. He becomes so famous that he becomes a very good friend of Shah Shuja, the emperor's son, who was the governor of Bengal province. Bauten moves to Rajmahal with him. Rajmahal now is a dusty crossroad town on the Jharkhand West Bengal border. But at that time, it was a sprawling Mughal settlement that served as the summer capital of the Bengal province. Soon after moving to Rajmahal, Bauten starts gathering on the ground intelligence about the possibilities of trade for the East India Company. He also exerts his influence with the prince to secure a firman or a royal permit so that the East India Company is allowed to do tax-free trade in Bengal. After the usual schmoozing and palm greasing in the high royal circles, Boughton sent word to the East India Company's court of directors in London in 1649. He said that he had successfully secured a permit from the emperor for the East India Company to settle not just in Rajmahal but also in Patna and Hooghly, the three major commercial hubs in Bengal province. Not just that, the company also got the right to do tax-free trade from the emperor. But there was a catch there. The company had to pay about 3,000 rupees as annual tribute. Now, 3,000 rupees might sound cheap today, but it would have been equivalent to about 3 lakhs or about 300,000 rupees in today's money. So that was not an inconsiderable sum for a fledgling business enterprise with very limited capital. Boughton also wrote that if the company played their cards right this time, they could expect to make huge profits by buying good quality saltpeter, which is an important ingredient for gunpowder, and then also silk and cotton textiles, and good quality sugar. He urged the company to immediately send a ship, but with people with good business brains only, and also with money only, not any nonsense items like broadcloth or lead. This news was received with excitement in England, and the East India Company's stock prices shot up. They dispatched a ship named the Lioness to Bengal under the command of Captain John Brookhaven in 1650. Lioness arrived in Balasore on the east coast of India in September of the same year. On the way though, it had to dodge several Dutch attempts to sink the ship. That was a 17th century version of literally cutthroat business competition. While Brookhaven remained at Balasore, two street smart businessmen, James Bridgman and Edward Stephens, were sent up to Hooghly and other cities to coordinate with Boughton to set up the company's trade posts there. Some other assistants joined them in the next year, 
Among them was a man called Waldgrave. After this, there was complete radio silence. The Madras Council of the East India Company, who were in charge of trade in Bengal, were getting really, really anxious. Whatever news trickled in was grim. Dr. Boughton had died sometime in 1653. His widow had probably married Bridgman, the leader of the group, and then Bridgman deserted the company. He took with him Boughton's wealth and all the property that Boughton had. It also turns out that Bridgman, Waldgrave, and others were misusing the royal permit. They were fudging accounts and using East India Company's money to buy saltpeter, silk and sugar only to sell it off to the East India Company at steeper prices and under imaginary names. As a result, the company's employees were getting rich at the expense of the company's resources. This situation went on for four long years. The East India Company's Madras Council had not received a single page of accounts from Bengal. They had also only received very occasional evasive responses of the letters that they had sent. Four years later, in 1654, the Madras Council and the Court of Directors in London decided to do something about it. The Madras Council ordered Bridgman, Edward Stephens and Waldgrave to come to Madras with all the paperwork that they had failed to send and face charges. A ship was sent to Hooghly to receive them and bring them under supervision. But by the time the ship reached Hooghly, Stephens had already died and Bridgman had already deserted the company. Waldgrave was the only person who would be able to come. Yes, you heard that right. So basically, you are asking those who are convicted to themselves secure and bring evidence which will prove their conviction. What? Who thinks like that? Well, everything was going well though with Waldgrave until the ship reached Balasore. There, Waldgrave feigned severe seasickness. He started going into fits of rage and refused to board the ship again. And also, he wanted to be left at Balasore. He also refused to part with the paperwork that he was carrying. He said that it was his responsibility to deliver the paperwork by himself as commanded by the Honorable East India Company. Finally, a compromise was reached. Walgrave was allowed to travel to Madras, but overland. It took several months for Walgrave to reach Madras, with absolute radio silence from his end. No one knew in Madras when he was coming, whether he was coming at all, or even whether he was alive. He was in very high spirits when he finally arrived in Madras in late 1656. When the company asked him to produce the papers he was to bring, he failed to produce a single page of the accounts. He said that a couple of days after leaving Balasore on foot, he was looted by the bandits. For some reason though, they had spared his life and even some of his money and had only stolen the account books he was carrying. Now that is not suspicious at all. Well, Walgrave was of course acquitted after this as very conveniently no evidence was found to incriminate him. The loss of the company was much larger than expected. It was not just a monetary loss. Walgrave was also bringing the original Furman or the royal permit from the emperor that allowed the East India Company to do tax-free trade in Bengal in the first place. No copy of the original was ever made and later the company would have to bribe the emperor again to get a fresh copy of the firman. So what is the moral of this story? Well, number one, don't ask a criminal to produce proof of their own crime. That is never going to end well for you. And number two, maybe always make copies of important documents, even though it means that you have to spend hours trying to make a handwritten copy of it. So that was our episode today. Thank you very much everyone for tuning in. Do let me know what you thought about this episode. Also, please do not forget to subscribe to Stupid History Podcast on Spotify or Podbean. 
You can also follow us on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. It's a Facebook page and YouTube channel of Heritage Walk Calcutta to listen to more such podcasts and other videos and other stuff. To support our research at this trying time of global pandemic, please make a donation on patreon.com forward slash heritage walk cal. That is patreon.com forward slash heritage walk cal. Thank you. Stay home. Stay safe and keep smiling. I'll see you next week.